I'll use this. Is, do you want me to use the microphone for the purpose of the webcam? So, yeah, I bet I made a webcam. So, uh, if, if I can see, you can see me. Yeah. Uh, well, you can watch my image. Well, that's me, that's not there. Okay, uh, so thank you very much indeed for uh, being bored with us tonight, but you, you can decide at the end whether I deserve it. Um, I've uh, recently written something about. Uh, Talk about leadership. Uh, I, I, I don't expect you all to buy it, but I just, just, uh, just instead. But if anybody does, I'll give you, I'll, give you, I'll come up next week and sign it. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, what I thought we'd do to start with is uh, I understand you've got uh, groups and things that uh, you, you can split into. And I'd be really interested to know just forget about what we've done about leadership in OB. Uh, if you can remember. What I'd be really interested in is whether there are people in your life who you would regard as your leader. Okay. And I, what I'd like you to do uh, is get into your groups and maybe discuss that for 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. And, and uh, then come back with some names of people that you you would regard as you, you know, your leader. Maybe you don't have any people. But, but that, I'd be interested know from your perspective what uh, what you think of as, as leaders or who you think of as leaders, what you think of as leadership. So do you want to do that for about, if we uh, reconvene in about a quarter of an hour, we can have a little discussion and then I can use that to kind of springboard uh, to talk about some of my own ideas. Okay? So you, you've got your own groups? Or Oh, really? Why don't you get into them and, uh, and, and just come up with names of people who you would regard as, as, as leaders? In your life. In your life, yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have to be your boss. It can be if you want. I think that's quite a lot. Alright, okay. Let's go on then. Are you in your groups already?
because she is leading a life that loves civil servants to provide different kind of service and responsibilities to serve the Hong Kong people. Okay. So he has to lead a lot of like civil servants. So um, you know, like whole a really big team. So if he has to, she has the ability to be, like provide directions and yeah. Like, right. Should I put provide direction? Yeah, provide yeah. directions. I can't find it. Uh, give me a, a, a leader 
from uh, you know, very famous people uh, like Steve Jobs or the uh, Hong Kong CEO. Um, and then people who I might imagine are quite ordinary. I mean, Sonny, would you would you regard yourself as ordinary or are you extraordinary in some kind of way? Or maybe it's unfair to ask you, what about other people who put your name down for us? Is Sonny just you know just another person or is she different from uh, the rest of the people? Dressed 
or not dressed as the, <laughs> as the Greeks uh, tend to be in, in, in sculptures. So he was um, he, he's often regarded as the, the first person who's, who was widely regarded as a leader. So the Greek uh, for uh, leader is hegemon, uh, from, from which we get words like hegemonic, so, which um, is, is, is a favorite social science term that nobody really understands. But it means uh, things that you just take for granted if you don't examine think the hegemonic. Anyway, uh, Alexander the Great was a, was a general who uh, invaded most of uh, uh, Eastern Europe and got us, he was Greek, he got as far as India, which in almost 3,000 years ago was quite the cheap. He quite made it to China, but uh, he was, he was a, widely regarded as a sort of uh, prototype for all the leaders that, that followed. And uh, again, in Western thinking, uh, there's a lot of people who write about leadership. Uh, people like Sigmund Freud, Max Weber. You come across these people? I'm sure you come across Weber in your OB courses. He was the uh, somebody who wrote quite a bit about uh, bureaucratic authority. But he also wrote about charismatic authority, which he he sort of um, dichotomized bureaucracy with charis charisma. Well, what I'm saying is that people with
with corporate power, you know, places high up in the hierarchy, these days get called leaders. But that isn't really a traditional idea about leaders. A uh, traditional idea about a leader is somebody who's got charisma, um, you know, who, uh, who inspires others to, to follow them and so on. Uh, but your average corporate CEO probably isn't like that. They just get called leader because they're at the top of the, 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 the hierarchy. Um, they're, they're not necessarily somebody who's a, a charismatic, inspiring person. They might be. But uh, the chances are that they won't be. They just, you know, uh, we used to call them things like managers and executives. Now we tend to call them leaders. Is that something that happens in, in Hong Kong? Yeah, there's some nods here? Or, or do you stick with more traditional terms for uh, bosses? Yeah? I just, I just wonder, nowadays I find that, nowadays yeah. I find that most of the leaders, whoever get a MBA or whatever, could be in a position, uh, it's just a whole bunch of interesting people. <laughs> and I don't think that they can inspire. They just put in a position and then suddenly they have power. Yes. And then they don't know how to use it and never inspire. And then it's just a mess. Right. Well, uh, I, I completely agree with you. Right? So, so what this gentleman is saying is that the people who find themselves in positions of power that they're at the top of the hierarchy. Here we go, somebody was talking about using power. Just by virtue of that fact, just by having, you know, being, being at the top of the, the hierarchy, they're, they're poor leaders. Um, to me, that is, that is almost absurd, actually. Uh, and that's what really this, my, my book's about, about the kind of absurdity of uh, modern ideas about leadership. But I'd be very interested in, in, in you know, what, what my work is, is largely based upon is what we do in, in the UK and, and, and the US, largely. So I, I, I think there's, there's a big cultural element to this. So I'd be very interested to explore your ideas uh, in, in, in a Hong Kong context. Okay. But having said that, all, I've, I've done the, these sorts of lectures with uh, British students and obviously they, they give slightly different uh, examples of people that they regard as leaders but all of them are very similar to the ones that you've been in there. Uh, so, um, this is what we're going to do over the next, I don't know how long it will take, I don't have any questions you ask me, but um, what, what did these uh, big thinkers like Freud and, and Weber have to say about leadership and, and how does that differ in more detail to some of the popular ideas about leaders today and why does it matter anyway? Who cares what we call bosses, whether we call them leaders or whether we call them executives or bosses, administrators? And then um, one of the things I'm going to show is that these, the, the, the idea of calling bosses leaders is a new one. It's only been around for maybe 20 or 30 years. It started perhaps around the turn of this century, around the year 2000, so probably not much older than you are. This, this and then, uh, who's interested in being served by this? Now I'm wondering what will happen in the future. So, okay, um, do you know who this is? The, the, the guy at the top? Or you mean the guy at the bottom? They're, they're both similar era, uh, and they're both uh, German speaking. So Max Weber was a, a German sociologist around the turn of the century, he was the one at the top. And um, uh, Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud, was an Austrian um, doctor turned uh, psychoanalyst uh, around the same time. Uh, he died in about 1940. Max Weber actually died of flu in 1919. But I think they're more or less, you know, the same thing, right? Anyway, Freud, you know anything at all about Freud, you'd be surprised to hear that he, he was interested in the erotic type, interested in all sorts of things erotic, between leaders and followers. He thought there was something, if, uh, 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 take Trump for example, Donald Trump, who were about to impeach a someone who was this morning. Uh, 
Uh, he undoubtedly has got millions of people in the US and probably other places who really, and I use this word advisedly, who really love him. You know, whatever he said in the election campaign that he ran, that he could shoot somebody up, you know, on, the, on the main street of New York with the silver of the election. Because so many people just think he's wonderful. And that's the kind of thing that I think Freud was getting at when he was talking about this erotic tie between the leader and his followers. Somebody who really is an attractive person. I'm not sure, quite sure whether I go so far as to make it a sort of sexual attraction. But I think that, that's, that's what uh, um, Freud was getting at here. And uh, certain people around the time of the Second World War used his work to an analyse the rise of Hitler. Hitler being another person who undoubtedly had lots of followers who were extremely faithful to him. A uh, very charismatic individual. Uh, at least I, the reason I mentioned Trump is because there's been a quite an influential article written about him that uses Freudian ideas. Um, now, the other person uh, who I'm going to talk about briefly is Max Weber, uh, the, the person who wrote about bureaucratic authority that's uh, important in, uh, in, in OB. I'm not sure you've come across it as well. Um, but he also talked about charismatic authority. The idea that there are certain people who've got a certain something that makes them really attractive and people follow them. Uh, so here's a quote from uh, one of his books. The leader's charismatic claim breaks down if his mission is not recognized by those to whom he feels he has been sent. But if they recognize him, it's the duty of those who he addresses to recognize him as their charismatic, qualified leader. So in other words, there are certain people in this world who we just recognize have got something. And uh, so for... For Weber, they were mainly political and religious and, and sort of military figures, great men. And uh, again, I say men advisedly because he was talking all, always about men. Uh, and the thing is, he explicitly say that people like a stockbroker or a CEO, people who have been a, you know, appointed to jobs, they can't be charismatic leaders by definition. Yeah, they have to be people who arise outside these sorts of formal structures. Uh, so uh, he, he explicitly ex exclude from being a leader somebody like the CEO. Now, what does so, so that's some of the classical work on, uh, on on leadership. So if you get a textbook out about leadership. Maybe the one that you read when you were doing leadership in OB. I think what you probably find um, is that this textbook would say anybody can be a leader. Is that, is that right? You don't have to be a senior person to be a, a, a leader. All you have to have is followers. So, uh, Sonny, uh, who, who, you know, you, you, it sounds like you've got followers in your group, and therefore you are a leader. So it doesn't really matter that, as far as I know, you haven't got any that hierarchical position. You have not appointed you uh, to be the leader of that group, but they regard you as their leader. So that's good enough. So that is something that comes across in these leadership textbooks. However, is that right? I mean, uh, uh, am I, uh, I'm not making this up. Uh, this, is, is this something that, that chimes with what you were taught in leadership? When I teach OB, Yeah, 
So, so your keyword, uh, Kelly, is, is influence. Yeah. Uh, but, but I suppose the problem with that is that we all influence one another, whether we like it or not. You know, it might be for, it yeah, might be, it might be for, for, for good, but it might be for bad. Mm. Or, but, you know, all of us, if one of us wasn't in the room, the dynamics would be slightly different. Um, but, but I think that although OB textbooks tend to say anybody can be a leader, anybody can have influence, what they also tend to do is invariably talk about bosses as leaders. Now, I mean, how many people have got part-time jobs or something like that at the moment? I'm guessing quite a few of you know what it is to work in a paid job. Is that right? Not if, if yeah, 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 yeah. Um, how many of you get on well with your, your boss? Do you like this guy or woman? You're not it. Yeah, well, I think there are surveys that we talk about in the book. Uh, they're quite regular surveys of uh, what people think about work. And most people, something like it averages out that 85% of people in work hate their boss. 85%? 85%. Oh. Yeah. Now, don't forget that most people do very mundane, ordinary jobs. You know, uh, and if, if you are lucky enough to have one of those jobs, you all are certainly hate your boss. Because what his, your boss's job is to get you to work as hard as possible for as little as money as possible. And if they're effective in doing that, then you certainly will hate I, I mean, I, I would hate um, So I don't think it makes much sense to call your average boss a leader if, if most people who are working for them hate them. Um, but nevertheless, uh, leadership textbooks tend to talk about bosses as leaders and tend to talk about ordinary workers as followers, which I just find, uh, I'll use the word again, uh, somewhat absurd. It's not, the, uh, it's not the experience of most people. It's kind of a romanticized view of work, think about it. It's, it's a, a term that I use earlier. <laughs> uh, and, and also, um, even when they're criticising the fact that often the term leader is used as a kind of synonym for manager, uh, even when they're doing that, they, they, these reviews themselves often use the term leader as a sort of synonym. But the interesting thing, I mean, I think, hasn't this university got slow or something, the, the, the management school about creating leaders or something like that? That's, that's one of the things it wants to do. Probably does have actually. Uh, anyway, lots of places do. Uh, you can see that in my own business school, our uh, kind of uh, boilerplate slogan is leading business thinking. So there's the, the L word there. Uh, if, if, you, if you say that your, your mission as a business school is to create leaders, are you wanting to create bosses? People in charge, people who want money or something? Or are you simply wanting to create people who are influential and important or something? And there's a nice bit of ambiguity there. If you say that you're creating uh, future managers or something, it's pretty clear that what you're trying to do is get people good jobs, you know, get promoted and so on. Whereas if you say something like, uh, uh, we, we want to create leaders, it's a very nice sort of uh, ambiguity. Because it doesn't make you sound terribly kind of hierarchical and rationalistic and, and all that kind of thing. You want to create nice people, but like uh, some of these. Uh, but also, it can be read uh, if you want to read it like that. Because actually, we're going to create bosses and get get good jobs for people. So, so, but it's got this nice double-edged. Side to it, and they're very useful. And we'll look at some of these uh, other levels of ambiguity in a moment. So, okay, uh, one of my favourite uh, writers about leadership is a guy called Keith Grint. There he is here. And he's, he's written the textbook, A Short Introduction to Leadership. And he says, the simplest definition of leadership is having followers. Okay, so you think um, all these people 
And it's, it does follow, uh, forgive the pun, uh, Max Weber, in the sense that it, it, it's sort of implied that leaders are special people. Because I don't think most people would think that they have followers. I mean, how, many, how many people think that they've got followers? Would you, would you ordinarily think of yourself as someone with followers? I mean, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't think of myself, I should say, as somebody who has followers. And I, I don't actually like the idea of being a follower myself. It, um, would, would you see yourself as a follower? Say, at work, if you were boss. Would you actually use the term follower? I don't know whether they to translate well. You know, I mean, I, I, I know that uh, follower is an English word. But if you look at uh, one of the things that uh, I, we do in the book, is we look at uh, the words that occur very close to um, follower. So follower of, what's the next word? In, in English, in English English, as opposed to American English, can anybody guess what, what's the commonest word that comes after follower in, uh, in ordinary sort of day-to-day -day magazines and newspapers and ordinary day-to-day -day speech? Anybody have a guess? Follower, so a follower is, or a follower of, or something like that, what's the next word would you say? Listener. 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 A follower is a listener. No, no, no. I know what the answer is. Uh, is it yeah. staff? Staff, no, no, no. But follower is very rarely used in kind of management work. Oh, okay. You know, outside leadership textbooks and things that talk about leadership, where they tend to talk about followers, if you go into corporate reports or newspapers and things, you won't find stories about followers. It's a very unusual word, actually. It, it relatively rarely occurs in English. Um, and I mean, uh, I'm sure, I, I guess that's probably the same in uh, Cantonese. It's, it's a relative, you know, you don't find yourself talking about followers very often. Oh, that specific word. Is a one follow other opinions? Follow the leaders of the leaders role? So, uh, well, um, that is it, a, one. It, it is going back to what the next word is. Leader is, 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 is there. It's, it's certainly not the, the commonest by a long way. Anyway, I'll tell you, it's Christ. Followers of Christ. Oh. It's, it's a religious term. Uh, uh, and and it's, it, it means something, or, or the resonances, the kind of um, implications of, of the term, is something a bit like disciple, something like that. It's got a kind of religious uh, halo around it. Um, and it's very odd to me that that's used in a word context uh, by, by leadership, by leadership scholars. Um, but anyway, Keith Grint says you have to have followers to be a leader. And then he, but he doesn't say what a follower is. I mean, how, how would I know whether I have a follower? How, how would you know? I mean, uh, Sonny, have you thought of your, sorry, sorry to pick on you, but they, they said that you were their leader. Have you thought of them as your followers? No. I, I, I'm not surprised. I, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's a very odd word to use. And if you, uh, if you talk to people in workplaces, very, very few people actually like to think of themselves as followers of their boss. Because it has, in a work context, it has a very kind of negative connotation. It, it feels like you're just going to do what you're told, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, let's uh, move on. So basically, what I'm saying is that leaders and followers in most of the literature about about leadership, and then that is the same term really as what we as manager. It means exactly the same thing in a, in, a, in a strictly sort of dictionary definition. So a leader is a boss, and a follower is uh, is a worker. But the interesting thing is that uh, going back to the way that these words, patterns that these words create, and the way that they use, it's 
got a very different, what we call in the book, a semantic aura. So a leader might be the same as a manager in lots of contexts, but if you use this term leader, you're giving a very different impression of the kind of person that we're talking about. In other words, the, the term leader kind of does things that the term manager can't do. Because if you think of yourself as a manager, you sound as though you're sort of boring, bureaucratic, industrial, and also conflicts built into this term. Managers are people who tell others what to do and they don't like doing it. Whereas a leader is somebody who inspires other people to do something they actually want to do. And that's much more positive. But in practice, I think that's a very romantic sort of view. But it's nice to be able to think of yourself as a manager. Uh, sorry, as a leader. And less prestigious to talk about yourself as a, as a, as a manager. So I think there's that kind of thing going on. Another thing is that uh, if you talk, you talk, to your, talk about yourself or if others talk about you as a leader, it really links you to these uh, great figures from history. I'll give you an excerpt from uh, uh, a leadership writing. So you get all this reflected glory. What's this called? Leaders can start thinking of themselves as great and good having a question authority and things like that because of this, this heritage that we've got that supposedly leaders in the tradition of favour are people like Mother Teresa, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, these people come kind of from history. Now let me find, let, let me um, give you an example of something that we have in the book. So there's a, an opening of uh, an article about leaders in a, in a very prestigious uh, management journal called the Academy of Academy Review. Let me just read out the first few lines. History is replete, replete with examples of leaders who are renowned for their positions of moral authority, for their status as paragons of virtue and goodness, and for their ability to motivate their followers to do good deeds. Martin Luther King um, worked for equal rights and inspired his followers to fight for justice. While Mahatma Gandhi, there he is, uh, um, emphasized compassion for the, the less fortunate. Winston Churchill is widely renowned for demonstrating and inspiring loyalty to the British crown, for God's sake. <laughs> um, where, well, Mother Teresa, there she is, the token woman, um, is particularly well known for her emphasis on the sanctity of body and spirit. Now, I, I'm not sure I agree with any of that anyway, <laughs> but what really starts to worry me in the next sentence, many CEOs of American corporations such as James Byrd and Johnson & Johnson are admired for their care and compassion, while others, such as Whole Foods CEO John Mackey, are admired for their focus on purity. Now the point I'm getting at here is that if you talk about these CEOs as leaders, somehow it's kind of plausible to compare them to Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi or whoever it happens to be. But these guys, they're just doing jobs. I mean, <laughs> you know, they're not changing history in the, in the kind of way that these people uh, mostly do. But, you know, they're not outstanding figures. The other thing is, that is, is quite fun. If you look up these CEOs uh, on Google or something, you will find that um, they're, they're not as good as we might assume. So, John Mackey, has anybody been to the States and gone to one of its stores? It's full of vegan products and, you know, uh, all, all these organic stuff and all that kind of thing. Anyway, um, John Mackey has been embroiled in controversy over his attitude to healthcare reform and his controversial, strong market and anti-union views. So he actually said in public, uh, it, he said, uh, look at the crowds, he 
compared the trade union movement to herpes, sexually transmitted disease, saying that it doesn't kill you, but it's very unpleasant and will make a lot of people not want to be your lover. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you know, they, they, these people have got a different side to them, but, but simply try, you know, comparing them to these great figures just seems, well, absurd. That's the third time I've used this, uh, the, the, this language. Uh, and it had, had the article uh, been talked about these people as managers or CEOs or something like that rather than leaders, then this kind of comparison simply wouldn't work. But it, it does work, you know, it, it, first reading, wow, these, these guys are great guys, you know, they're, they're, they're like uh, Mahatma Gandhi or whoever. The other thing is, um, leader, because it's got all these uh, connotations with greatness and goodness. We've got, um, in the book, we've got a whole list of things that uh, tend to go with leadership, uh, with the terms that go with leader in, a, in the context of organisations. So, uh, let me just find it. Um, So you can talk about uh, adaptive leaders, altruistic leaders, authentic leaders, benevolent leaders, change leaders, charismatic leaders, coaching leaders, cross-cultural leaders, CSR leaders, democratic leaders, distributed leaders, embodied leaders, empowering leaders, ethical leaders, blah, 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 blah. In fact, there's hundreds of these terms that don't work with the term manager. And I've just picked one. Uh, this servant leadership. Maybe we did it when we were doing our third being course on leadership. Um, but you can't... I, I'm saying that the word manager and leader basically mean the same thing. But they do different things uh, in terms of their cultural connotations. So you can't really talk about the servant manager because it just sounds sort of daft. But it works with leader because of all these connotations that uh, leader has got. Okay. Now, this might be okay, I suppose, if we thought that the bosses were typically great and good. But as, as I said with the, 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 the guy from Whole Foods, I'm not sure that he is as good as, as this author makes out. What's, let's have a bit of a discussion here. I, 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 I'm going to stop talking. Moment, if you'll let me anyway. What's your impression of, uh, do you think Steve Jobs, Stephen Jobs, sorry, do you think he's a good guy? I mean, uh, in, from what we can tell on uh, you know, his uh, websites and the way that he's been treated in the press and so on. What's your view of him? Well, not necessarily Steve Jobs, but, uh, you know, powerful people in industry that you're aware of. What would you say about the kind of moral authority and so on? Anybody like to volunteer your thoughts? Obviously other things are more interesting. <laughs> um, well, I've done that. Do you know how much the average CEO gets paid in the state uh, compared to the average CEO, sorry, the average worker in that company. Anybody like to have a guess? A lot. Well, a lot. A lot. It is a lot. I, I can put a figure on it. Let's see. Uh, so, uh, let's say the average person in, in your company gets paid, I'll uh, put it in US dollars, something like $25,000. Or would that be in uh, Chinese in, in Hong Kong dollars? But you know, it's, it's not it's not a good salary, but it's probably close to an average salary in the US. What do you think the CEO of that company gets? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me show you something. Um, at the moment, the, the latest figure is about 2016. On average, the big companies in the US. 
the, uh, the chief executive gets paid 270 times more than uh, the average pay of work. So this isn't the lowest paid person. This is the average for all the workers in the company. 270 times. The other thing that's interesting is that um, this wasn't always the case. So if you go back to, well, I go back to the 60s, um, really until the mid-90s, uh, CEOs in America got paid something like 20 times. What, yeah. Did you know even in Hong Kong, I mean in Hong Kong, the NGO, NGO, NGO CEO, yeah. get loads of the money. Yeah. So yeah. you know, like, like a social worker, uh, NGO, right. uh, so, it's a top heavy. So what you're saying is that even in, even in non-commercial companies, yeah. Yeah, uh, the CEOs get paid very disproportionate salaries. That's right. Uh, even as disproportionate as this, two hundred and twenty times. How interesting. This, uh, <laughs> but but the thing is, I mean, uh, the, the, these are the figures for the states, so that I wasn't able to get them for Hong Kong. But I suspect they're very similar. You know, Hong Kong economy is quite similar, running quite a similar way to the, the U.S. Now the interesting thing. As I say, is that until the mid 90s, CEOs got paid something like 20 or 30 times what the average person got paid in an organisation. But then suddenly, in the 90s, it started to take off. And you know, the graph goes, whoa, it rises very, very quickly. Uh, so it's, it's come around, as I say, about 200 and 70 times. Uh, so it means that, it, you know, uh, that they're massively better paid. And at the same time, the average worker is getting paid. Uh, I mean, most people have got somewhat better off in that, in that same time period, but you know, the, the, the average pay of, of most workers is, is really, you know, it's gone by, I think, in the last 10 years, something like 5% in the UK. So what's going on here? How can we explain this? Have we uh, have any thoughts about this? What, why is this something? I, I think nowadays all, all the so-called leaders, a lot of them are managers, and it's go through the elite system in a way. As long as you can be there, it doesn't matter your leaders or not. Mm. Or you have no no capacity to inspire, mm. and people may not respect you. Mm. As long as you're there, yes. uh, you you are grounded as leaders, but you are sick influence. People may not even like you. Well, one of the things we argue in the book yeah. is that this it's we don't think it's entirely coincidental that this fashion for calling top people leaders in a kind of unreflective way because anybody who's a CEO gets called a leader happens to coincide with this huge change in, in their salary. Now, I mean, we're not saying uh, at all that simply by suddenly calling people leaders it increases their salary, but it's a symptom and a kind of cause of uh, a deeper malaise in society. To um, I don't think it's because suddenly they got better and suddenly they were leaders in a way that, you know, that, that, that made them much more influential. I think part of uh, calling people leaders, is, it, it's an invitation to say, admire me, see me as special, pay me more. Now, has anybody come across this idea of neoliberalism? Are you, are you in your last year? Well, the last year of your degree? Yeah? Not that many of you, you know, I like some numbers. <laughs> so if you're in your last year of your degree, you have to come across the idea of the other ones. I think I'm going to have to have a word with Kelly uh, Because it's, it's a major idea uh, that society itself is becoming kind of. Uh, more individualistic, more market-based, and all that kind of thing. 
Uh, and, and, and the unions are much less powerful than they were 30 or 40 years ago. And, and what, what seems to happen is that people have been studying leadership in business schools, in America at least, since the 70s, since the 30s. But it wasn't a particularly popular or prestigious thing to do. And then it suddenly took off around the same time, around the 90s. And um, our explanation for this is that it's the popularity of leadership, the idea that top people should be rewarded and called these prestigious, flattering things, is really a symptom and perhaps a cause of uh, this the triumph of the business over everything else. So the, the, the gentleman here who gave the example of the NGOs in, in, in social work, one of the reasons why NGOs and social work get paid uh, a lot more than the CEO because they're trying to mimic business. I think that's partly, would you agree with that? They're, they're, you know, they're running a social work kind of enterprise in the same way as making Coca-Cola or something like that. You know, because it's, it's deemed to be better than running into the public sector or whatever. So uh, what you do is you have a CEO who's like a, a business CEO. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, and what our book basically argues is that the rise of the leader, uh, this, this unexamined idea of having a leader who's in charge, calling him a leader rather than the CEO, or whatever, is basically um, the symptom of this change in society. And it's helped to uh, speed up the change in society. Now, if we talk about managers, and by the way, I'm, I'm coming almost to an end, I can feel as though uh, you're getting into the um, Traditionally, when we talk about managers and workers, which uh, most organisational studies have done uh, over, over the years, one of the things that builds into that is this idea of conflict. Um, managers are the kind of people who tell their workers what to do. Typically, their workers won't like it, they'll try and resist doing what they're told. But, you know, there's a hierarchical re a relationship built into that, and there's also this idea of conflict that kind of acknowledged in the idea of uh, managers and workers. But if you start talking about people as leaders and followers, then what you're doing is camouflaging the conflict. Because leaders and followers, people, who, you know, are playing for the same side. They're, they're, they're trying to score goals at the same end. Uh, whereas managers and workers, you know, are on different teams. So if you can get people to believe that they are followers of great leaders, then it's, then it's a way of doing or trying to do away with conflict. Or at least camouflaging conflict. Now, another uh, famous social uh, scientist, you might call them that, from the 19th century, not, not Weber or uh, Freud, but uh, Marx uh, talks about the, uh, the structured antagonism uh, in, between managers and workers, or, or at least between owners and people who work for the owners. Because the incentive for the owner is to get workers to work as, as hard as possible for as little money as possible. Whereas the incentive for the worker is to work as little as possible for as, as much money as possible. So there's clearly built into that kind of relationship uh, a conflict. So things like talking about managers and workers is a kind of uh, acceptance of that uh, structured antagonism. Whereas I think talking about leaders and followers is trying to deny that. Uh, I used to work in healthcare quite a long time ago then. Uh, but um, in healthcare these days in the UK, and I suspect in Hong Kong, um, the, the top people are all called leaders. Now in the 80s, when I was doing things like industrial relations in, in healthcare, it, you would just be laughed at as a manager if you tried to call yourself a leader. It, it would just be ridiculous. Because of the, uh, the, 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 the well, as I say, the structured antagonism between the staff side and the union side. Uh, but because I think of, of this neoliberal society that we now live in, uh, where managers are able to get away with talking about themselves as leaders, uh, get people convinced that maybe you know we're all on the same side. So I think there's a there's a big political thing going on here. It's not simply a question of you know, a superficial name check. I think it points to something really quite fundamentally 
that's changed in the nature of workplace relationships over the last generation. Okay, I'm almost there. So what, what's going to happen in the future? Uh, with you know, talking about history is all very well, uh, but what, what's life going to be like for you when you get your jobs and you know you become a leader or whatever happens to you? Well, I think we're going to talk about leaders for a long time. There's a lot of incentives to do that. Uh, I mean, in organisations, um, bosses love to to think of themselves as leaders. I mean, one of the things I, I like doing is I'm, I'm a bit subversive. Is in my work at the university, I've got a boss who likes to think of herself as a leader, and I'll, I'll self-consciously tell her she's a manager, and she really doesn't like that. She really thinks of it. She really loves to think. But the other thing that perhaps even more important is that there's loads of people who've got jobs doing leadership training, and you know, big organisations spend massive sums on leadership, leadership development, and stuff like that. So I think there's, there's lots of incentives to carry on thinking about bosses as leaders. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I do think it is a bit rich and it's almost too obviously self-serving for people who are in, in top CEO jobs getting paid 2% of the time for the average worker's salary to say that they're a servant leader or authentic leader or something like that. I mean, it's, you know, I'll say it one more time, I'll, I'll say it four times, I think it's absurd <laughs> and, it, and it's sort of obviously absurd. So I wonder how long they'll get away with it. <laughs> we shall see. So, one of the things we end up saying uh, in the book is that uh, leadership is a kind of fig leaf that covers up the embarrassment <laughs> of, of corporate greed. But, you know, who knows what will happen? Predictions about the future are particularly important. Um, so, uh, what, would I, what would I recommend you do? Well, I, don't, I, I think one of the things we can all do is not routinely talk or think about bosses as leaders. Strike that term out of your lexicon. Don't, don't think of uh, bosses as leaders. Think of them as managers. That, that, that makes sense to me. I think that's empirically true. Even administrator is a better term. In, in fact, administrator is, is the best term. When I, when I was a, a, a health service administrator, so that's, that's what I was called. And I think, uh, anyone going to do an MBA when you finish this, uh, this degree? Anybody thinking about an MBA? Do you know what MBA stands for? Come on, somebody can tell me what that MBA stands for. Masters of Business Administration. Thank you. Now, one of the reasons it's called Master of Business Administration is because the first one was, it was uh, introduced, I think, at Harvard University in 1910. And in 1910, all the way really up to the 60s, uh, prestigious people in organisations were called administrators. Hence they got Master of Business Administration. Uh, one of the things we say in the book is that um, if MBAs hadn't been invented and that they were being invented in uh, 2019, they would almost certainly be MBLs, Masters of Business Leadership. Because, uh, you know, the term, the, the common term in 1910 for what people doing that job now was administrator. Now it's a leader. Uh, but one of the things we, we, should, we have quite a lot of fun looking on social media uh, in one chapter looking at how people boast about being leaders. What we call it, we call it humble bragging. These people who go on LinkedIn and say, I was really, you know, I was really privileged to be appointed to this new job, which makes me a leader of 500 people, something like that. And um, bragging like that is something that leadership, that the, the, the sort of language of leadership, really encourages you to think about yourself in that kind of way. Because if you start thinking about yourself as an administrator, it's much harder to brag about it. But it's actually much more realistic and much more kind of, uh, you know, uh, reflecting on what you actually do in, in these sorts of jobs. So when people
people ask me what I used to do in healthcare, I always say I was an administrator. <laughs> Partly, you know, uh, I'd certainly never say I was a leader. Thought. Anyway, um, I think what we're, what we're trying to do in the end is to make people think. Because I think uh, what's happened with leadership is that it's become all embracing. We, we use the term without actually stopping to uh, examine it. Uh, so, you know, I hope it makes a contribution to rethinking the, the leadership craze of our time. So we've got a bit of time to discuss or, or not.